time. Help me praise the Lord. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me say again how glad I am to be here. I even sang a song for that church. I sang my favorite song, Me and the Devil Had a Tussle, and I won. And that didn't bless them. I don't even know what happened. No, I'm just cutting up. We had a lot of fun there. I'm just glad to be home. One more time, smile at your neighbor. Say, you ready for the word? Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Uh, I am, tonight I am go doing the Bible character of Hagar uh, in the story of Abraham and Sarah. But before I do that, I want to take five minutes. Uh, Brother Ed, look at your watch. In five minutes, wave, wave, wave your hand at me, okay? I don't want to take more than five minutes, but I want to, I want to you just stay there until after I read my text, okay? Um, something came to my attention today that I want to real quickly address because I think it's important. Um, there is an article that was posted on social media. I think it was Facebook. I haven't seen it myself. I heard about it from another pastor, but it's evidently making a lot of rounds in churches similar to ours. And it's about a, a, a praise and worship group, uh, Spring Hill or New Spring. Uh, who's out of Australia? Hillsong. It's about Hillsong. Um, they write a lot of praise and worship songs, and um, I think we sing some of their songs. I'm not real good on who wrote what, but I'm pretty sure we do sing some of their songs. And um, uh, the article is, is written uh, by a, a Baptist pastor, and I, don't, I love the Baptist, don't speak against the Baptist, but I just want you to understand the story, okay? A Baptist pastor wrote an article that's very condemning of, of Hillsong and um, basically went so far as to accuse them of, of, of being a demonic um, or influenced by demonic powers and whatnot. Um, now, everybody has a right to their opinion. I, 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 that Baptist pastor is not my enemy. I just want to take a minute, and I want you to understand why I think that is wrong-headed and why that I, I think that is creating the wrong culture. Um, if, if so many... Uh, people similar to us and churches similar to us hadn't picked up on the thread, I wouldn't even address it. But um, I, I do think it's important enough to address, and I'm going to very quickly uh, give you the reasons why. First of all, we know from the Bible that everyone has permission to praise the Lord. Can I have an amen? Everyone. In the Bible, we are given the directive, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord, praise ye the Lord. That means atheists can praise the Lord. Okay? That's, that, means, um, that means anybody can praise the Lord. And more, the Bible shows us pictures of inanimate objects praising the Lord, the trees and the rocks and etc. So everything that hath breath praise the Lord. So people, all of us, are challenged, indeed encouraged to be that part of the creation that praises the Creator. Can I have an amen? Okay, so now even if you make an argument that it's not worship, and you go to the story of Jesus and the woman at the well, and even if you make this argument, which I, I'm not doing, but I want you to understand rhetorically, even if you make that argument and say, well, the Lord, you know, there's a difference in praise and worship, and what they're doing is not worship. Um, even if you make that argument, the, that passage tells us this, that God is seeking those who would worship Him in spirit and in truth. God is seeking. Okay? So even if you make that argument, it does not take away anybody's right to praise the Lord, to sing songs to the Lord, to glorify the Lord. And I, I, this shouldn't come as a surprise to anybody in this church, but even if you're the biggest sinner in town, you still have a right to praise the Lord. I mean, even if you're, you know, infamous, <laughs> you have a right to praise the Lord. Okay, so uh, the next thing I would say is that same pastor who was really quick on the draw to call Hillsong a demonic would call all of those people like us that are agreeing with him, he would call them demon-possessed too. Why? Because they are spirit-filled. 
and speak in tongues, okay? And so he would call them. And so when you just jump on the bandwagon and you're quick to judge, even on social media, it creates a negative culture. Am I over five minutes yet? Okay, it creates a negative culture which hurts the witness of the church. We are not in the business of making enemies. We let the wheat grow up with the chaff. We love people, yes? Someday, the one who was just will work all of this out. In the meantime, the religious community, the church people, we have more challenges with new atheism, with some of the legal challenges that are coming to us because of social changes. We don't need to be making enemies with people who write praise and worship music just because we disagree with something. It's wrong-headed. I don't want to be a part of a church like that. I don't want to go to a church like that. Okay. Now, if you saw that article today and you liked it and you shared it, I want you to know I'm sorry if I embarrassed you. I have no idea if you liked it. And you probably didn't. You probably just rushing through and liked it or shared. I don't know. I, honestly, I'm not just saying that to cover myself. I sincerely did not let myself look once I had a pastor friend call me all up in arms because it was anyway. And I was like, okay, I'm not even going to look. I'm just going to answer it. I like the biblical picture on judgment as to what is the work of God and what is not the work of God. Uh, remember the teacher of Paul? Really quick. Am I over five minutes? Oh, they're not even looking. They're over here talking in the service. My God. I'll tell you one thing. People will go any. Five minutes. Okay. Well, tough. I'll take seven. Okay. You get you get for talking in church. Here's, the, here's a beautiful standard in the Bible. Now, remember G Gamaliel? Gamaliel? Who was he? Gamaliel, he was the mentor slash teacher of the Apostle Paul. Okay, they came to him and they said, what's going on? These, all these people coming to the church, all these people getting the Holy Spirit, all this stuff's happening. We've got we've to do something about it. We've got to stop it. And Gamaliel said something that saved the New Testament church when it could have been crushed. Now, God was in it, so it would have come somewhere else. You see what I'm saying? It would have, it, you can't stop God. But at, you can stop at one place, and the Lord goes around another way. Gamaliel said this. He said, look, let's not speak against it. This is the New Testament church. He says this, and this is beautiful. He said, if it's not of God, it's going to just fade away. He said, but if it is of God, you don't want to be on the wrong side of God. Good advice, yes? All right, okay, that's sermon number one. Here comes sermon number two. I'm building you double tonight. Genesis 16, and I'm going to read at uh, verse number seven. We are talking about Hagar, and it is a beautiful story, and sad, but beautiful. We can stand. We, we're in the habit of standing. We can stand. Um, then Sarah said, excuse me, verse number seven. Now the angel of the Lord found Hagar by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. And the angel says, Hagar, Sarah's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? Don't you love when God asks rhetorical questions? God already knows where you came from and God knows where you're going. He wants to know where you think you came from and where you think you're going. Because it matters where you think you came from and it matters where you think you're going. And so she said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarah. She doesn't know where she's going but she knows where she ain't staying. Don't know where I'm going, but I ain't staying there, okay? So the angel of the Lord says to her, return to your mistress, submit yourself under her hand. Then the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly so that they shall not be counted for the multitude. This is her prophecy all the way down through verse 12. And then she says back to him, verse number 13, then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees. For she said, have I also here seen him who sees me. So tonight I'm going to entitle this, The God Who Sees Me. If you think you've heard me preach a message on this entitled, The God Who Sees Me Before, you would be absolutely correct. No, I'm not recycling. I'm just using the title again. God bless you. You may be seated. Okay, so... 802, all right. Um, Hagar is the story of a, uh, a slave girl who was brought into the family of Abraham and Sarah and became part of the story of the covenant. She is a complicated part. She, you might could think of, is a wrinkle 
in the plan, and yet God did not abandon her, and God did not forsake her. And her story, although sad, becomes a picture of the error of humanity, the bitter crop that is the result of faithlessness and the transgressions of human nature and finally the steadfastness of God. Uh, Her name Hagar literally means stranger. I always am amazed how names in the Old Testament in many cases will align with a life and so you get a lesson in the story that's not just a context but it's also a character. So Hagar is living as a stranger. She is not of the tribe of Abraham. She is not of the tribe from which Sarah comes from. This is the beginning of the Jewish nation as an independent uh, identity, an independent people. And uh, she is brought into the tribe, and her story has certain themes that come to light when you take a little bit of time to look at them. And uh, I will remind you, most of you guys know this, but I will remind you that it is through Hagar that all of the Arabic nations will descend. So you have in a lineage, you have uh, starting you know, from Adam, you would come down through the lineage and you would come to Abraham. And on one side of the family through Sarah, you would have the people we think of today as the children of Israel, and through Hagar, you would have all of the Arabic peoples who, in spite of being in a a family association, have in many cases identified themselves against the children of Israel, and they have been They have been enemies one to another. This is before all of the politics complicates it. This is before the struggle for land and power, etc. complicates it. This is back when uh, Abraham is a quite aged and somewhat wealthy nomadic tribesman. And Sarah is an elderly but regal uh, woman of uh, no small influence and formidable personality. And Hagar is a young teenage, teenage girl. And so it starts very quickly. It starts uh, in the, what we would think of today as the Bronze Age, somewhere around 2000 B.C. And this is the period in Egyptian he- history that we would think of as the Middle Kingdom where most of the tremendous works were built. And I'm going to show you some pictures of that uh, here in just a moment. Uh, when Sarah was taken to Egypt with Abraham the first time. Uh, and there, the, uh, because of her beauty, uh, she was desirable to the, uh, the, the leader of Egypt. And, and you guys know the story. Abraham showed his personal fortitude and bravery by saying, hey, let's pretend you're my sister. Um, and otherwise, I'm going to get killed and you're going to 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 be taken from me and I'll lose you either way at least this way I lose you but um I will live this is an act of doubt on Abram's part God has already told him that he would be with him God's already told him he had a spiritual purpose for him but Abraham can hold on to a promise in his head he just cannot live it out in his life we still have that problem Because if his faith is strong enough, he's able to say, no, you're my wife, and they can't kill me because God's blessed me. But that's easier to preach than it is to live, yes? Uh, And so he comes up with this plan because we all know God a lot of times doesn't know what he's doing, and God needs us to help him and figure things out. You know, God's lucky we can save him. And so uh, the story here, uh, he is the, the, the... Pharaoh takes uh, Sarah, and he gives to her um, a, a retinue, so to speak. It's, you would think of it as a bride price. I don't know if that's an exact a translation but, uh, or, or a comparison, cultural comparison, but you get the idea. Uh, and also, when he understands, when Pharaoh understands that that is not his woman, and he needs to keep his hands off that woman because that's Abraham's woman, uh, he gives her a, a, another, another blessing. And it is believed by scholars that this young lady, Hagar, was given to Sarah as part of either the bride price or part of the get out of town with a smile price. 
Both of them were gifts to her that ultimately accrued to her household and to Abraham. Hagar, thus, is a girl who has grown up with Egypt as her world. She is not a nomadic tribes woman. She has not lived in a tent. She does not she, that's not her world. Her world is Egypt. So very quickly, um, I, I presume you guys have my, my PowerPoint ready. Okay. Um, what I did is I found online some reconstructions of some of the uh, works that happened in Egypt in the, what they would refer to the Valley of the Gods. Um, all of the three great pyramids probably were not completed when, er, when Abraham was there, um, particularly uh, the, the big one, the Giza, I believe. Um, it, it, they were not all uh, completed, but remember in Egypt in that Valley of the Gods, there's over 200 pyramids. So many of them were completed. Give me the first slide in that, and I'm going to see how these pictures come out. Uh, this is how the pyramids look now. They look like stacks of mud bricks. You see that? It looks like you sent a toddler out there with a bunch of left, not a toddler, but say an eight year old out there with a stack of mud grips and said, Build me something. That's what we think of. Now, it's impressive because it's big, yes? It's impressive because even today we would have difficulty moving some of those blocks that each one can weigh 20 or more tons. It, that, that's what we think it, but I want you to understand something. That's not how it looked in the Bronze Age. In the Bronze Age, uh, that uh, pyramid was covered by an outer later layer of stone that has all been removed over the centuries and stolen. It was covered by a layer of stone that is white limestone quarried in a place called Tura, which is southeast of Giza on the other side of the, Na of the Nile. It's quite soft, and it can be worked by, like marble. And they built the foundations and the structure out of mud bricks just like that. But when they covered it, they covered it with Tura white stone. And when you saw it from a distance, it would not be rubbly like that. It would be clean, geometrical, tiny joints, and it would be almost perfectly symmetric perfectly ge geometric and symmetrical, and it would be gleaming white. Give me the next slide. This is probably closer to what the pyramids would have looked like from a distance. Gleaming white stone, the top of which uh, some type of a beaten bronze or a mixture of bronze gold or something to create that, that burning sun. And remember, these pyramids are aligned with the sun, so it would be no accident that standing in a certain place you would see as though the top of the pyramid was on fire because it's arrayed in line with the sun, the constellations, the whole... Uh, uh, solar system, and the sun coming across would have gleamed off those white limestone-covered pyramids and the golden tops of which would have perhaps blinded you in the right spot. Give me another, give me the next slide. Uh, this, again, is a reconstruction showing you the association of how it perhaps would have been laid out. Uh, and give me the next slide. This would be from the Sphinx. Uh, tell you what, uh, I, uh, it worked out well. Uh, go, uh, Go back one on the slides. Uh, you can see the Sphinx right there where, the, where the, uh, the, the harbor turns in there where they could deliver uh, things. You see the Sphinx, that's where you would have gotten off. See, this is a walled compound here. If you were coming in, you'd come in there and you'd got off at the Sphinx. Now go back to the, uh, the other one, the next picture. And getting off of your, your galley, your ship, this is how it would have looked. White gleaming pyramids in the background. The Sphinx, notice all the color. That would have been how it looked at the time. Go ahead and give me the next slide. Um, this, in comparison, is a, a picture uh, from an actual mural that is in Egypt in a place called Beni Hassan that shows an Egyptian artist drawing what he, drawing a nomadic tribe entering into Egypt. So 2,000 years ago, or roughly, uh, you get the idea, um, an Egyptian artist drew a nomadic tribe coming in. You'd see their beasts laden. You would see them with uh, animals that they would herd. And you would see, in some ways, you can see the dress there. That is how they saw nomadic people. Now, this tribe may have been from south, down from the Nubian lands. And, and Abraham may have been, uh, well, we know Abraham was from the north. 
Um, and so it's not to say uh, they looked exactly like this, but this is to say in the Egyptian mindset, this is how they would have perceived uh, a nomadic tribe coming in. And let me point out to you, the Egyptians condescended in their heart toward the nomads. They thought it was a terrible way to live. They thought it was a terrible way to accumulate wealth. And they, the Bible tells us in one place that the Egyptians despise a herder or a sheep herder or a goat herder. They just think it's, a, it's beneath them. They are people of buildings and people of land, not wandering tribesmen. And so you, you can see here some of these images. This is the world Hagar grew up in. She grew up in Egypt. She grew up in brick-paved roads, not everywhere, but in, in the, in the high-note high, high note areas. She grew up in seeing, perhaps not every day, but knowing that this is the kind of civilization that would build monuments like the, the Valley of the Gods. And even if Giza, the pyramid at Giza, was not completely finished, many of the other ones were. So this is the world. She feels as though she has been, she has been demoted. Because she went from having access to the Egyptian world to being given to a nomadic people as, as a slave. And further and further, uh, she discovers that her, her mistress, Sarah, and uh, her master, Abraham, she, she discovers uh, that they are absolutely convinced that they are going to have a child. And they're both closer to 150. Now, one thing Hagar knows right away is that she has been placed in the house with crazy people. Because faith always looks crazy from the outside. In fact, if you let this world control how you think, you'll start thinking your Christian faith looks crazy. If you let Hollywood set your values and your ethics, you'll start thinking serving God looks crazy. If you get your morality from the local university, you'll think the only smart people are unbelievers. It always looks crazy from the outside. Yes, it looks crazy, but in this instance, God is involved, so crazy is true. Okay? Now, now you, you guys know the story. Um, Sarah... Sarah comes up with this plan when she cannot have a child. She comes up with this plan where she is going to do something that's culturally accepted, a little weird for us in our modern, modern worldview, et cetera, uh, but, but very much culturally accepted at the time. And we have to be careful not to try to put modern morals on an ancient world. It's just not fair. They, they wouldn't understand, and we don't understand. None of us want to go there. I don't know if any of them want to come here. We'll, sure, we'll figure that out at another time when we all get together on the other side of Chile, Jordan, yes? But the point is, is they, in the culturally accepted manner, uh, she said, Sarah said, look, um, let's, let's, let's have you um, take uh, Hagar, and uh, perhaps you can have the child that has been promised. Now, there's two, two ways to look at this. First of all, I'm going to give you the pretty way to look at it, the, the, the good way to look at it. Uh, the way that's respectable and honorable. That's not about Sarah, but I want you to see it. It's, it's an interesting story. You could say Sarah, by removing herself, her presumption was that she was the problem. She was the holdup. She was the block to the purpose of God. And she had the self-discipline to say, the work of God's bigger than me. The purpose of God's bigger than me. If I'm included, great. If I'm not included, I guess not so great. But still, I'm willing to step aside and you can say, at this moment, Sarah has a beautiful spirit. And what matters is the purposes of God. Oh, hallelujah. I'll see you at the big boy after church. <laughs> That's an old, oh, old joke, which you guys totally missed. And so, um, so, so that's the beautiful way to look at it. Here's the not so beautiful way to look at it. And there's more evidence for this than the other. I hate to say that. She thinks she's not the problem, Abraham's the problem. And I'm going to prove it to you by letting you take Hagar. And she won't get pregnant either. Because baby, it's you, it ain't me. So, Hagar, Abraham, sitting in a tree. K-I-S-S-I-N-G. We don't need to have a talk about the birds and bees, do we? I don't want to do it, it'd be weird. Hagar comes up pregnant. And Sarah is furious. This is why there's a little more evidence that she thought Abraham was the problem. 
She is furious. Everything changes. It was her idea. Read it in multiple translations I have. Study it. Multiple translations I have. It's nobody. Nobody ever translated this was Abraham's idea. This was Sarah's idea. And then when Hagar, you know, and she comes up pregnant, Sarah is furious. And her whole attitude to Hagar changes. And she begins to persecute Hagar and berate Hagar and belittle Hagar. And Abraham, he's about useless when it comes to women troubles. Now, you let someone take his nephew Lot. They may be five kings from neighboring kingdoms, and he's ready to pull the sword. Bless God, we're fighting every corner in town. Go kill them all. Let God sort them out. Hallelujah. But you let his wife get going, and he's, yes, dear. Yes, dear. Yet whatever you want to do with the poor darling. This was your idea. I just, I just, I just showed up and sang the song. I did not come up with this plan. You were the cheat. No, I'm not going to make that, that. I caught myself. You're proud. I'll tell you after church, you'll love it. That would have been bad. <laughs> um. This was your plan. I just sang the song, and look, I, whatever, do what you want with poor Hagar. Hagar has asked for none of this. And she becomes an image of someone who is caught by events larger than herself. She can't control those events. All she can do is do the best with what she's got. Let me tell you a truth about your life. There's going to be more than a handful of situations where you have to do the best with what you got. There's going to be more, of a, more than a few of handful of situations where I'm going to have to do the best with what I got. Now, I can sit around and suck my thumb. I can be angry. I can make a list. I can check it twice. I can sharpen my knives in the closet. But let me tell you, I, I got to do the best of what I got. That's what Hagar has to do. This is beyond her. This is bigger than her. And her mistress begins to berate her. Sarah begins to berate her. And the Bible says, and this is, <laughs> this is the verb the Bible used, Sarah humbles Hagar. Uh, I don't know what that means, but um, uh, it's the same word. Just so, just to give us some comparison, let's, we're all about being fair here tonight, okay? That's the same word that is used to describe the treatment of the Hebrew slaves by their Egyptian taskmasters. Humbled them. So, um, this humbling evidently was pretty serious, and Hagar scares her to death. She's pregnant. Now, um, I don't know about you, but in most cultures, a pregnant woman is like this chalice, and everybody protects them, and everybody, you bump them, and it's like, whoa, watch yourself, watch yourself. Don't, don't go down those stairs, you know? It's, it's like this. It's a good thing, right? It's a beautiful thing. Uh, it's motherhood. I mean, it's the cradle of civilization. And so here, here you have the opposite of that. Here's a pregnant girl out on the road by herself. This is, this is terribly dangerous. She's out on the road. And you know what? Alone and unaided, she takes off. You gotta like somebody with spunk like that. They may get on your nerves, but you gotta like somebody with some spunk, yes? Unaided, alone, she makes a heroic effort, and it is a tribute to her tenacity that she got as far as she did. She went all the way down. She made it all the way down to uh, on a trade route we think of as the road to Shur. That's how it is remembered. But you can actually see this path in the Bible. The country is fearsome even today. The, the hills are a real, I sh oh, I sh that would have been, that's something I missed. I should have got some pictures of that part of the country and showed to you tonight. I'll do better next time. The, uh, the hills are eroded like bare bones on a moonscape. It's arid. The earth in that part of that country is tormented by these continual desert winds that just strip, as it were, the, the moisture out of your body. And she is running, and uh, she is trying to, trying to get there, uh, and she stumbles at this brook, and the Lord is waiting on her there in the form of an angel, a theophany. Uh, whether or not it was a theophany, she thought it was a theophany being an actual representation of God as opposed to just a directed spirit with a message like an angel. Um, and so she, she, in this moment, is, um, is terrified. The Lord asks her this question, where, where are you coming from? Where are you going? She answers. We read it together. I don't know where I'm going, but bless God, I ain't going back to that crazy couple. They're crazy. I, I do what they ask me to do, and then I get punished for being successful. Uh, it just doesn't make any sense. And so um, she, she is told by the angel to return but she is given a promise, and uh, she is told, your descendants are going to be 
greatly, uh, greatly uh, blessed. They're going to be multiplied, the Bible says. You're going to be with child. You'll bear a son. That's the greatest gift for a woman of the time. You'll call his name Ishmael because the Lord hath he has heard your affliction. He shall be a wild man. His hand shall be against every other man and every man's hand against him. He shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. And that is a promise to her that this is not the end of her story. Sometimes all you need is hope that tomorrow the sun's going to come up and you're going to be there to see it. Sometimes if you get down low enough, you just, need to hope, you just need someone to send you a telegram that says, you, howdy, this is not the end, full stop. I'm here to tell somebody here tonight, whatever you're going through, this is not the end. Is that fair? This is not the end. And, I, and then comes the hard part. I want you to go back to your mistress, Sarah. Uh, the point being... Um, you are not going to make it here. Isn't it interesting how when we run from life and when we run from God, we place ourselves in a more dangerous situation than where we were at to begin with, and it feels like we're doing the right thing. Let me just real quick right here. If any of you ever get in a place where you're struggling in the church, you feel like you don't have friends, you feel all alone, you feel like no one's you know, being a support to you, Please don't go from zero to 60, or let me say that. Don't run all the way down to sure before you ask somebody for help. All of us, even in good churches, sometimes feel alone. <clears throat> we recently, sometime back, we had some people leave, and when I talked to them about it, they said, well, we didn't have friends. We didn't make any friends. We didn't connect with anybody. And I said, yeah, but what's tragic is this is the first I've ever heard about it. There's other people in the church who have your interest. There's other people who would like to get together with you. Don't quit today. <laughs> Don't go zero to 60. You will, in running, put yourself in a worse situation, but it'll feel like it's the right thing. And it'll take an angel to show up and say, wait a minute, you're going to die out here. You need to go back. And there is an interesting, an interesting uh, uh, reality when you read the text. We don't know exactly, but it seems, that, it seems that when she gets back, it's not only herself that's been humbled, it's both Abraham and Sarai realizing they have sent this, like it or not, son of Abraham out to be risked in the desert. And when she comes back, you never read of Sarah intentionally going, doing the same thing to her again. It's, it's, it's a different type of relationship. Tension, yes. Disagreement, yes. But not the same exact situation. And when she comes back in the end of the chapter, it's very matter of fact. She comes back and the Bible simply says, Hagar bore Abraham a son. Abraham a son. He had identity. He had place. He was Abraham's son. Uh, and so... Here you see, you see this, this moment in her life where, yes, she has to humble herself. Yes, she has to return. Um, later on, later on when uh, the promise of the Lord is fulfilled through Sarah and um, when Isaac is, is born, uh, Ishmael is a teenager. Ishmael is a 14-year-old boy, and, which is not to say he was, he was big or, or anything uh, he may have been a, a little guy, but uh, he, he was uh, 14 years old. And um, he is now, now in a situation of who is the heir? Is it going to be Ishmael? Is it going to be Isaac? Um, now, in this time, in this place, remember, we have to be gentle with ancient cultures. It was a different world. But women in a multi-wife household... Uh, like Sarah and Hagar, spent a lot of their time planning on how to advance their particular child's, child's interest. In my study of the women of the Bible in this series, I'm, I, I've gone through so many women in the Bible that ultimately have a sad story, and the sadness comes to them through their children. And um, there's, there's, I'll be total transparency, there were two or three women I was reading about that um, the story was just, it's, too, it's, it's so sad that I, I haven't figured out yet how to make it worth teaching without having everyone leaving and going home and taking Prozac. I mean, it is sad. And in this particular time, 
this particular time, there was, it was so much struggle, intra-family struggle, because of the process of heredity, because of the lack of opportunity. Uh, I, for one, am thankful that the Lord saw fit to put us in this world as imperfect as it is. I'm thankful for that, and I love my antibiotics, and I love my hot showers, and my coffee, and my air conditioning. Thank you very much. Tension, let me quickly move to the next scene. Tension grows, and in chapter number 21, uh, Isaac again uh, tries to solve the problem by uh, sending away, uh, he sends away uh, Hagar and Ishmael, and now now he is, he is an older boy. He's either 13 or 14, depending on how you do the timeline. And they are sent into the wilderness, and there, there they are. There, there they are, um, again, beset by risk and danger. And um, they, poor planning on Abraham's part. Uh, I... I don't want to try to make Abraham look bad. I think he did a good enough job of making himself look bad in this situation. Um, but Abraham did not send them away escorted. He just sent them away. Um, and this, I think, is, uh, is, is something for which uh, he would, in retrospect, have done differently. Uh, he, he sent them away. And literally, you have a woman who is uh, uh, in, her, in her middle years, which probably means she was more broken down than the average middle-aged person nowadays. Um, and she has a 13 or 14-year-old boy, and they are alone in the wilderness. This is not ideal. They run out of water, and uh, Ishmael is doing worse than Hagar, and he's about to die. And the Bible uh, tells us the story in Genesis chapter number 21. And again, it's moving, and it is... It is, it is uh, Touching to our hearts. She thinks, Hagar thinks. Now, Abraham woke up in the morning, made up his mind. Uh, and he takes bread and a skin of water. And he goes out and he calls Ishmael and, and Hagar to him. And he gives them the skin of water and gives them bread and says, get out of here. And so they depart and they wander. They're unescorted. They don't have a plan. They don't know what to do. They, are, they wander in the wilderness of Beersheba. And when the water in the skin was used up, the Bible tells us, and Ishmael's about to die, verse number 15 of chapter 21, Hagar lays Ishmael under the shade of a shrub, and she walks off a bow shot, which 100, maybe 200 yards, and uh, she sits down at a distance, and she says this, and this is so poignant, let me not see the death of the boy. And so she sat at a distance, she lifted up her voice, she wept. God heard the voice of the lad, verse 17. And the angel calls to them and says, What ails you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise and lift up the lad and hold him with your hand, for I will make of him a great nation. And the Lord opened her eyes to see. It had all been there, but she couldn't see it. Sounds like some of us. It's right there, we just can't see it. Her eyes are open, she sees a well of water, and she goes and runs to it, fills the skin with water, takes the water back to her lad, her son. In verse number 20, so God was with the lad, and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness. And um, I want to, uh, there are some quite, uh, I think quite a beautiful art from this scene uh, that I wanted to share with you as a way of placing an image in the story, not just the story, not just the words of a narrative, but some images, and I'll try to share with you uh, some of who, 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 who some of these uh, pictures are. If you'll give me the, the next picture in our, our series. Uh, this is a picture by, um, I think that is number seven or number six, of them, of, of Hagar in her uh, wandering in the wilderness. And uh, they are, of course, I'm trying to find my notes on that. Uh, that would be number six. I don't know all of these artists off the top of my head, so I can't find number six. Go to the next one. Uh, here's another famous uh, picture. This is by the artist William Ladd Todd, and you can see his imagination of her with Ishmael as he is dying of, of, of dehydration. 
Uh, give me picture, the next picture, please. This is perhaps my favorite of all of these pictures. This is um, by uh, Richard, Richard McBee, I believe it is. And um, this is, I love this picture because it's as though they've just been sent away and she's weeping, and Ishmael not knowing the consequences, and the 13-year-old boy doesn't know the consequences, so he's trying to comfort his mother. I, I, I love that picture. I wanted to share it with you, um, and uh, I think that is finally uh, a picture by uh, Jean, uh, no, this is the picture by Jean Charles Cazin of Hagar and Ishmael, and uh, so these are just artists trying to place an image in place of the story. Hagar Hagar has a difficult life. Let me point out a very few things and I'm done. In fact, uh, uh, musicians, you can come. Um, Hagar has had no control in this whole swirl of events. The only control she had was perhaps she was guilty of provoking Sarah. Okay, look, if that is the sin, we have all proven ourselves to be sinners. Because every one of us have got that little word in. Yeah, I'm talking about you. All of us have been guilty. Other than that, Hagar has had no control. She did not ask for this. All she can do is do the best with what she's got. And so, this is what I know in the few years that I've been walking this earth. I don't have near, near the wisdom and experience that some of you guys have, and I readily admit that. But if there's one thing I've learned... In our lives, there are circumstances where we have some control and there are circumstances where you don't have control. You literally take the hand that life place, places in you, your hand, the, the, to use that game analogy, and you do the best with what you've got. Wouldn't it be great? Everyone wants the rook if you're playing rook. Everybody wants, what is it, the joker if you're playing... Come on, my brother. Everybody wants... You understand what I'm saying? Everybody wants the good cards, but there are circumstances in your life where you do not have the good cards. All you can do in those situations is get up, quit feeling sorry for yourself, and believe there's a God that sees you. Oh, somebody needs this here tonight. The beauty of Hagar's insight is she doesn't just meet an angel. She says, no, 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 you're the God that sees me. Do you see the difference? It's easy just to have a moment in a service where you cry a tear, you feel a prayer, you sing a song. It's more than that. To go from that moment into something more, God's on my side. God sees me. God is going to help me. And to live with a trust and a knowledge that God's going to be a friend. And he's going to be a comforter. She does not see a palace riseth out of the desert. No, she gets water. She does not see some type of a lottery won in a spiritual realm where she sits upon some throne of Egypt. No. What does she need? Water. What does she get? Water. In the situations of our life where we've done our best and it's out of our control, you know what God's going to give us? Exactly what we need. He said he would supply all our needs according to his riches in glory. And the image I love in this picture is this idea of her taking her son, shading him as best she can, and walking off and then having a conversation with God. God, I can't see him die. I, I can't. The best thing I can do with situations in my life that I cannot control is bring him to an altar. I don't have control. If I, if I could fix it, it'd be fixed. I don't have control. It's a mess. You know what I can do? I carry that problem to an altar. And I lay it down. And I say, God, I've done what I can do. I need you to get involved now. And that's where you take your problems and you bring it to Jesus in faith. And you know what you get? You get an answer. You get what you need. You get help. And the promise, the son, grows up and is strong. And the picture of Hagar is somebody never has control, never loses her faith, never feels, never, never lets self-pity destroy her. 
She just does the best she can day after day after day. You know what? I want to say this, and I'm done. I've seen some of you guys do the best you can day after day after day. And sometimes I've taken you to the Lord, and I've said, Lord, they don't know how to fix this, and I don't know how to fix it. I don't know what to do. But I'm laying them and their troubles with you because I know you didn't bring us this far to leave us under a bush. Let's all stand. Reach over, take your neighbor's hand, put a hand on their shoulder, whatever is appropriate, whatever feels good to you. Lord Jesus, we pray one for another in this house. I don't know what my neighbor is going through. I don't know what my brother in Christ is going through. I don't know what my sister in Christ is going through. But Lord Jesus, I know your strength is real. I know your promise is sure. I know your anointing is authoritative. It can make a difference. It can break down a dividing wall. It can give wisdom. It can give strength. It can give confidence of spirit, assurance of soul. Lord Jesus, I'm praying your strength to them. I'm praying your anointing to them. I'm praying your blessing to them. In Jesus' name. Let us leave here with confidence in our heart. Let us leave here with with the joy of the Lord in our heart and soul and spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Would you lift your voice? Clap your hands. Let's praise the Lord one more time before we're dismissed. Hallelujah. 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 You know the old prayer that people put on the, it's an awesome prayer, by the way, they put it on the the refrigerator, Lord, help me to have the grace to accept the things I can't change, (laughs) have the, what is it, wisdom to change the things, no, the strength to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Okay, the stuff that's killing your life right now, it's killing your life. Do you have control or do you don't have control? If you don't have control, you need to bring it to an altar, and you need to give it to God. Can I have a big amen? God bless you. You're dismissed. Thank you for worshiping with us on this Wednesday night. We love you all. Have a great week. See you Sunday morning. Going to have a move of God.